Welcome, I'm Katherine Hadro, and this is EWTN Pro-Life Weekly. It's not racist to want to save those children. That's a very eloquent statement, and we all know that Planned Parenthood was begun in order to, to kill black babies. Abortion hearing. Lawmakers held what became an intense and emotional hearing on abortion in the United States. We are joined by pro-life representative Virginia Fox for her reaction to the pro-abortion Women's Health Protection Act and speak with one of the hearing's pro-life witnesses, pro-life OBGYN Dr. Ingrid Scott. Plus, the Biden administration announces it is reversing a pro-life policy and once again will allow Planned Parenthood to receive federal family planning dollars. We have reaction. Roses and rosaries. Archbishop Salvatore Cordelion tells us about his latest prayer initiative aimed towards Catholic Speaker of the House Nancy Pelosi. Hear why he says we all need to fast and pray and why the Women's Health Protection Act is nothing short of child sacrifice. And healing from trauma. A pro-life group is hosting the first ever men's conference directed to help them heal from trauma, including trauma associated with abortion. We hear from one of the featured conference speakers, a Catholic man who shares his own abortion story and how it's impacted him over the years. How could I, at 18 years old and barely scraping by, support a child on my own? And, and, and I would have been on my own. I was stressed out. I went home, my body ached, and I had this heavy bleeding. I felt so sick. I felt dizzy, nauseous. I felt like something was missing. I felt alone, but I also felt so resolved in my decision. Choosing to have an abortion was the hardest decision I had ever made. I, but at 18 years old, I knew it was the right decision for me. It was freeing. I was not supposed to be here. I would not be here had it not been for the very brave choice that my mother made 33 years ago. You can imagine the fear, the disappointment, the, the, the struggle, the internal anguish that my mother felt as doctors told her that she needed to abort her child. U.S. House representatives held what became a deeply personal and at times emotional hearing on the abortion issue last week. Three Democratic members of Congress shared their own past abortion stories, and Republican Representative Kat Kamick opened up about how she was almost aborted herself. Take a look at this picture after the hearing in which Congresswoman Kamick embraces Democrat Representative Cori Bush, who shared she got an abortion after being raped on a church youth trip. But the hearing was also profoundly political and divisive as the House Democrats who called for it said it was in response to, quote, threats to abortion. U.S. Representative Virginia Fox of North Carolina defended the unborn, saying this. It is becoming a common refrain for many women to say that, quote, I wouldn't be the person I am today if I hadn't had an abortion, end quote. Whether a pregnancy is planned or unplanned, or even the result of horrific circumstances, ending that child's life with an abortion to empower or protect the, quote, freedom, end quote, of the mother is not an answer. Abortion only compounds the sorrow. In response to Texas's heartbeat law, the U.S. House of Representatives in September passed the Women's Health Protection Act, which would expand abortion on demand by preventing enforcement of existing pro-life laws at the federal and state level, and it would block the passage of new pro-life laws. It is not likely to pass the U.S. Senate. And joining us now via Zoom is Representative Virginia Fox of North Carolina. Congresswoman, welcome back to the show. It was quite the emotional hearing on abortion last week on Capitol Hill. Three of your Democratic colleagues shared their past abortion stories. As we know, the pro-life movement shows great mercy and love to women who have undergone abortions. Some of our most prominent pro-life leaders have had abortions. Congresswoman, what did you make of the hearing? And what do you want to say to those colleagues of yours who shared their abortion stories? Well, first, I tell them I think it's horrible that any woman gets put in a place where she has to choose 
or she feels she has to choose an abortion and, and kill her own child. I just think that's a horrible situation to be in, and I don't wish it on anyone. But what I was con so concerned about during that hearing was the use of language and what appears to be happening as a, in our country is the normalization of abortions. We should never get to the point where we see the taking of innocent unborn babies as a normal thing to do. Um, I, I, you know, Representative Cori Bush said she felt like something was missing. And uh, certainly something was missing. It was her child mm -hmm. that was missing. And uh, I'm, I'm sorry she had the experience she did, but um, it's, it's really not an excuse to kill your unborn child. Mm -hmm. And I'm very, very concerned about what is happening in this country, the language that's being used, uh, the title of the bill, will, women's health protection, um, it, that's not what this is about. It takes no makes no consideration for the health of the unborn baby. Yeah, absolutely, very well said. I'd like to get your reaction to other big news this week. The Biden administration announced it is reversing the Trump era Title X Protect Life rule, which will now allow Planned Parenthood to once again receive federal family planning dollars. What's your reaction to this? Well. Um, Title X has always forbidden the use of Title X money for abortions. But over the years, Title X money was going into Planned Parenthood clinics in particular, where we know money's fungible. And so they were using that money, not necessarily uh, for abortions, but they could substitute the money they were getting from Title X and then use other monies for abortions. And that's wrong. That is not what we expect the money to be used for. Hardworking taxpayers do not want their tax dollars being used to destroy innocent life. Yeah, absolutely. We have one minute left, Congresswoman, but following the enactment of Texas's heartbeat law and ahead of this major Supreme Court abortion case, we are seeing extreme pro-abortion measures being taken, including the passage of the Women's Health Protection Act. Can you respond to that and this claim that abortion is necessary for women's health? Well, uh, the, the main thing that the Women's Health Act is going to do is going to do a lot of things, but it's going to take away all the rights of the unborn child. It's going to take away all the existing safeguards. It's going to let the abortionist decide when a baby is viable, when a baby is not viable. Uh, it, again, it overrides all state laws. It overrides any protection for the mother of the child. Mm -hmm. And that is so dangerous. We do not need the federal government stepping in where uh, there are protections for the baby. And again, nothing's being said about the destruction of innocent life as a result of this and it giving the uh, abortion lobby what it's been asking for for a long, long time, which right. is complete control over this issue. Mm. Thank you for your pro-life leadership, Representative Virginia Fox of North Carolina. Thank you. Thank you. The heartbeat indicates an independent human life. And as a pro-life physician who advocates for the fetus as well as the mother, that human life should be allowed to continue. That was Dr. Ingrid Scopp, a pro-life OBGYN in the state of Texas. She was one of the two pro-life witnesses last week at a House hearing on the abortion issue. Dr. Scopp was grilled by pro-abortion Democrats about Texas's heartbeat law. And joining us now on Zoom is Dr. Ingrid Scopp, a pro-life OBGYN and associate scholar for the Charlotte Lozier Institute. Welcome, Dr. Scopp. It, it was an intense and emotional Capitol Hill hearing last week on abortion. If I have this right, you were one of only two pro-life witnesses. What was your message to lawmakers last week? The reason I went to D.C. was to help cut through the euphemisms and the um, obscuring of the scientific data that occurs in the abortion debate. I went as an obstetrician to advocate for one of my patients who's too often neglected and to discuss the inconvenient fact that the Texas Heartbeat Act is prohibiting abortion at the time of the heartbeat, which is universally recognized as a sign of life. And 
too many people, I think, don't think about the individual unique human that is the fetus. Yeah. I love that you said you have two patients as an OBGYN. Doctor, the hearing and the recent Women's Health Protection Act are both responses to the recent Texas heartbeat law. You are a pro-life OBGYN in Texas. What are your thoughts on the Texas heartbeat law and how abortion advocates are responding to it with the Women's Health Protection Act? My goal is to um, uh, discuss this issue outside of the realm of politics, because people tend to take their side based on who they identify with, and to discuss it as a human rights issue. Um, the, the two, legis the legislation are both extremes. Um, the uh, Texas Heartbeat Act, it is a moral victory because this is the first time in 48 years that a state has been allowed to um, place restrictions on the procedure of abortion, the first time, mm -hmm. because Roe does not allow that. Um, the, the reason that it was able to go into effect is because there were some special um, um, procedures put in place that allowed the usual judicial um, enjoinment not to be able to happen. Um, so that was great, but when you have a society that continues to treat sexuality the same way that it does, and then you place a prohibition, you, it's concerning because there are already people trying to um, um, advocate for illegal abortions in Texas. Mm -hmm. um, and I care for the women. I don't want them to, to go through the danger of an illegal abortion. So we have a lot of work to do to um, change hearts and minds about abortion. Legislation alone is not going to be the solution. Mm -hmm. But the flip side, the Women's Health Protection Act codifies Roe. Most Americans do not know what Roe does. What Roe did is it formed a trimester system where no prohibition is allowed in the first trimester, only prohibitions for safety in the second trimester, but subsequent um, Supreme Court decisions um, Planned Parenthood v. Casey says that only if it doesn't place any kind of a burden and only in the third trimester, you can only prohibit abortion, but you must allow exceptions for health of the mother. And health includes physical factors, emotional factors, psychological factors, familial, age. So essentially, any abortion can be justified at any time in pregnancy with the way Roe is written and also with the way the Women's Health Protection Act is written. So it's very, very extreme legislation. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm just so grateful for your medically accurate language and for your testimony last week. Dr. Ingrid Skopp with the Charlotte Lozier Institute, thank you. Thank you, Catherine. Archbishop Salvatore Cordelion of San Francisco is calling on Catholics to pray rosaries and send roses to Speaker Nancy Pelosi following the House passage of the Pro-Abortion Women's Health Protection Act. Coeur Leon stated, quote, a conversion of heart of the majority of our congressional representatives is needed on this issue, beginning with the leader of the House, Speaker Nancy Pelosi. I am therefore inviting all Catholics to join in a massive invisible campaign of prayer and fasting for Speaker Pelosi. Commit to praying one rosary a week and fasting on Fridays for her conversion of heart. Catholics can sign up to send a rose to Speaker Pelosi by going to benedictinstitute.org. Cordelion is Pelosi's archbishop, and he's been a vocal critic of her pro-abortion stance, calling the recent Women's Health Protection Act, quote, nothing short of child sacrifice. And joining us now on Skype is Archbishop Salvatore Cordelion of the Archdiocese of San Francisco. Your Excellency, welcome back to the show. Tell us about this new prayer initiative of yours and why send roses. The rose idea came to my mind because we were approaching the uh, feast day of St. Teresa of Lisieux, the, the little flower of the child Jesus. And uh, we know about the tradition of her, well, that she said she would uh, shower, uh, do good and have do good on earth from heaven and shower a rose, sh uh, send a shower of roses. And there's uh, so many stories of people having their, having their prayer answered as seeking her intercession and then with the sign given of the rose. 
So that coupled with the praying of the rosary, we know whenever Our Lady appears anywhere, she always asks mm -hmm. us to pray the rosary. Uh, rosary uh, coupled with fasting. The fasting is the other part of it. Uh, we need to make uh, those kind of sacrifices, bodily penance. So I'm asking people to pray a rosary once a week for her specifically and, for, uh, and to fast on Fridays for her. The church, of course, understands a fast meeting, just one meal. It's possible to take a little bit of food other two times mm -hmm. during the day if, if necessary, but best yet to keep a strict fast on those days. So we, we need to turn back to God with penance mm -hmm. and, and for the conversion of what I call her maternal heart. She speaks so fondly of her children. Uh, I know she loves her family. So there's, there's a good maternal heart in there. We need to ask God to touch that and, and turn it back toward life. That's beautiful. And prayer and fasting, that's a powerful combination. You have called the Women's Health Protection Act, which did pass the House, nothing short of child sacrifice. I know you've seen this clip, Your Excellency, but I want to play for you how Speaker Pelosi reacted to that. The Archbishop of the city, uh, that area of San Francisco, and I have a disagreement about who should decide this. I believe that uh, God has given us a free will to honor our responsibilities. What is your reaction to that, how Speaker Pelosi responded? She almost seemed to distance herself from saying you are her archbishop, and she defended her stance with free will. Well, we all agree with that. Certainly God has given us free will, and God respects our free will even when we use it to kill the innocent. So uh, there's no, yeah, we have free will, but the, the Christian knows that uh, he or she must use the free will in accordance with God's will, which means we need a well-formed conscience in order to decide what is the right thing to do in a given situation. So it, it's a matter of forming the conscience properly so we can align our will with God's will and do what God wants us to do. Mm. I want to go back to that prayer initiative with the roses and the rosaries. Can you speak more, Your Excellency, to the responsibility we as Catholics have who are living at a time like this, our responsibility to pray and fast for an end to abortion? There's so much politicization of all of the issues nowadays, and especially this issue. There's so much bitterness, so much rhetoric. Uh, we need, again, to turn turn to God with, with prayer and with fasting to sensitize ourselves to the plight of so many women who, in reality, don't have choice. The problem is they don't have choice. When, when they're given choice, they choose to give life. So to sensitize ourselves to that and pray for God's mercy upon our country, that God might touch the hearts of so many people. Like I said, a majority in the House of Representatives need a conversion of heart, mm -hmm. that they would vote for something like this. Uh, uh, unfettered access to abortion for all nine months. Uh, that's why I called it uh, tantamount to, to child sacrifice. Mm -hmm. So but we, we need prayer and fasting if we have any hope uh, that God will, will bless us in turning our nation back mm -hmm. to a culture of life. And you have spoken very clearly saying abortion is a satanic ritual. Can you speak more to that? Because our culture equates abortion with health care. Yes, it's another one of the smoke screens they use, you know, the smoke screen of choice, the smoke screen, screen of health care, of, of reproductive choice, and so forth. The Texas heartbeat law is being challenged by the satanic temple, precisely on the grounds of it's a violation of their religious liberty. They need to have access to abortion to carry out their rituals. It's a satanic practice. Mm -hmm. And when we figure that, what is it, one out of four pregnancies in our country? ends in an abortion, we, we are literally in the grip of the devil. Mm. So we, that's why we need prayer and fasting so, so, so uh, much, so greatly. So I hope everyone will uh, engage in this prayer and fasting campaign. I hope so as well. And our viewers can find more information at benedictinstitute.org. Archbishop Salvatore Cordelion of San Francisco, thank you for your leadership and your time. You're welcome. Thank you. Staying on this topic of prayer, we need your prayers more than ever, especially as we prepare for the upcoming Supreme Court abortion case Dobbs versus Jackson Women's Health Organization. This case on December 1st 
will pose a direct challenge to Roe versus Wade and potentially will have major consequences for the pro-life cause. That brings us to this week's call to action. Go to ProLifeWeekly.com to find out how you can join us in praying for the U.S. Supreme Court and the Dobbs versus Whole Woman's Health late abortion case. When you go to ProLifeWeekly.com, you will get all the details for a nationwide prayer call happening this Monday, October 11th at 8.30 p.m. Eastern. Join me and Susan B. Anthony List President Marjorie Dannenfelser for prayer and prayerful conversation as we ask the Lord for his divine intervention and pray that the Supreme Court justices see the humanity and dignity of the unborn. We can do nothing without the Lord and we can do all things through him. We have a responsibility to pray for the unborn. Join us for this important prayer call on Monday evening at 8.30 p.m. Eastern by calling 833-380-0736. And you can go to ProLifeWeekly.com for that phone number again and all the prayer call details. The state of Missouri carried out the execution of prisoner Ernest Johnson Tuesday evening despite a plea from Pope Francis to spare his life. Johnson died by injection. The 61-year-old was convicted of killing three convenience store workers during a robbery nearly 28 years ago. In a letter, the Apostolic Nuncio to the U.S., Archbishop Christophe Pierre, wrote the Missouri governor that Pope Francis, quote, wishes to place before you the simple fact of Mr. Johnson's humanity and the sacredness of all human life. Johnson's attorney claimed he was intellectually disabled. Coming up, well-known American actresses joined thousands of pro-abortion protesters for the so-called Women's March this past weekend. I speak out next. Plus, Healing from Trauma, the first ever men's healing conference takes place later this month. What one speaker is saying about his own abortion story and how he found healing. Welcome back to EWTN Pro-Life Weekly. I'm Katherine Hadro. Thousands of pro-abortion advocates, including some celebrities, marched this past weekend in the so-called Women's March. That is this week's Speak Out segment. In what was the first Women's March during the Biden administration, demonstrators filled the streets this past weekend in a nationwide protest for abortion. The protest included thousands of people descending onto the steps of the Supreme Court, many chanting, quote, my body, my choice. Of course, a few celebrities also made an appearance. I'm tired. I'm tired as a woman. I'm so tired of having to continually prove that my body is my own. That was actress and activist Alyssa Milano addressing the Women's March crowd, and she wasn't the only celebrity in attendance. Two well-known American actresses, Amy Schumer and Oscar winner Jennifer Lawrence, who is pregnant with her first child, were also there. Schumer posted this photo on Instagram as the celebrities held up signs reading, quote, women can't be free if they don't control their bodies and abortion is essential. We've stopped pretending that the Women's March is for women, right? Pro-life women were once again excluded at this march, and organizers are being more transparent than ever about what their agenda really is. It's all about abortion. You need to know there is no such thing as abortion justice because abortion is the opposite of justice. It squashes the rights of the unborn, and that includes the rights of unborn women. I pray that those who attended the Women's March will one day see that, including actress Jennifer Lawrence, as she carries her own unborn child. May the gift of motherhood help to transform how she views the beauty of life. This month, a pro-life group is hosting the first ever conference specifically created for men to help them heal from trauma, including the trauma associated with abortion. That is this week's Pro-Life Focus. The pro-life group Support After Abortion is hosting the Unraveling the Roots of Men's Trauma conference on Saturday, October 16th. It is virtual and it is free. Organizers say it will address the unique aspects of helping men heal from trauma from an abortion experience and other trauma they may carry. 
Jeff Joaquin will be one of the featured speakers at the upcoming Unraveling the Roots of Men's Trauma Conference. He's a Catholic leader in men's ministry, and he joins us now on Zoom. Welcome, Jeff. Let's just dive right into the deep here. When you were 17, I understand you were involved in an abortion story. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, Catherine, thank you for having me. Uh, when I was 17 years old, my girlfriend at the time um, let me know that we had a quote-unquote problem with a phone call that she gave me. Uh, that problem was that she was pregnant. And um, at that time, being 17 years old, young and naive, uh, my initial approach to solving that problem was to suggest that she set up an appointment for an abortion. And about a week later, we went to uh, Providence, Rhode Island, and we had that abortion. And um, I can tell you this, the, the, the celebrity that was saying, I am tired. You know what I'm tired of as a man? I'm tired of so many of us men being cowardly and not standing up for the rights of our unborn child. We make decisions or we don't make decisions. Our spouses or girlfriends make decisions on our behalf. And then we spend the rest of our lives regretting the mistake that we made. We deny our fatherhood. Mm. We deny our right and our duty to be a loving, caring parent to that unborn child. That's what I'm tired of, mm. that we don't have you know, society tells us that this is a woman's problem, but it's also a man's problem as well. So, Absolutely. And I am so sorry for your loss. And we don't often hear about how abortion does affect men. Jeff, how does your child's abortion affect you? You know, Catherine, there hasn't been a day. The abortion was when I was 17 years old, the third week of August of 1987. I'm 52 now. And over that period of 37 years, 38 years, I have never once gone to bed at night and not thought about my aborted child. Mm -hmm. It's affected every aspect of, of, of my life. It led to, to drinking and, and other forms of abuse. And, and it's, it's been a deep, dark hole um, up until I got reconciled with, with God, the God of mercy. It was a deep, dark hole in my life that I could never avoid, that I could never fill. Mm. Jeff, we have just over a minute left, but can you speak to the importance of men who have a connection to abortion to seek healing? And why is this conference, the Unraveling the Roots of Men's Trauma Conference, so important? You know, Catherine, I first gave my talk in October of last year in the diocesan pro-life event that we had here in, in uh, Tampa. And Bishop Gregory Parks came up to me after. And he said, son, he came up to my wife and I after with tears in his eyes. And he said, son, I'm going to continue to pray for you because every man needs to hear your story. And it's been amazing, Catherine. You know, I, I, was, I was asked to participate in a men's march in Washington in June in front of the White House. Mm -hmm. uh, I was on Sirius XM channel uh, last week with Gus Lloyd. And now I'm here on EW, mm -hmm. at EWTN. To say one thing to men, men, if you've participated in an abortion, the God of mercy does not care about your past. All he cares about is your present and your future. Seek reconciliation with him. Understand the gravity of the mistake that you've made mm -hmm. and put that issue behind you. Seek reconciliation. Understand that you've made a mistake and then move forward with the rest of your life. Amen. Hiding, Amen. hiding that pain, hiding that trauma, it's only going to fester. It's only going to make it worse. Uh, thank you for speaking that powerful truth. And for our viewers, you can join the virtual men's conference on October 16th at menhealingfromtrauma.com. Jeff Joaquin, thank you so much. Thank you, Catherine. Have a good day. You too. That does it for this edition of EWTN Pro-Life Weekly. Until next time, we'd love to hear from you. Find us on social media at EWTN Pro-Life on all social media platforms. Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, we're there. You can also send us a message by emailing prolifeweekly at EWTN.com. We'd love to hear from you. Remember, life is a gift. Your life is a gift. God bless.